Hello, brothers and sisters. We are going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 21 today. John, chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 15, Lord willing, and finish in verse 25. And this will be our, our last uh, sermon in the Gospel of John for a while. I believe this is the 67th sermon in our Gospel of John series. And so I, I pray that we finish this uh, book well and uh, that God would be glorified and that we will certainly catch uh, the theme of everything and that, uh, Lord willing, we will tie it up nicely in a bow, uh, certainly by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need to pray together to ask God's help uh, before we get started. So let's pray. Almighty God, King of kings, Lord of lords, we do thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your kindness. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for life. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be a, a people who love your word because it's through your word that we know you. So Lord, we ask that today that you would be gracious to us, that Holy Spirit, you would speak through me and the, the truth of your word would go forth to your people for your glory. We pray that those who are listening who are under the sound of my voice and they do not know you, we pray that they would come to know you. And God, those who know you, that you would use this text to renew our minds. Make us look more like Jesus. Help us to love you more. God, please be with us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, like I said, we are in John chapter 21. Uh, I'm going to read through the text. So as you're turning to John chapter 21, I'll read in just a second. Let me catch you up. Uh, last week, where we were, uh, this is the, the... Brothers and sisters, we are in the Gospel of John today, John chapter 21. Uh, before we jump into anything at all, let me start with prayer. Almighty, magnificent, holy Father, we do praise you and thank you for your grace. We praise you and thank you for your mercy. We praise you and thank you for your love. We praise and thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for your Spirit. God, we ask that by your Holy Spirit today that you would speak through me and that the word of God would go forth. The truth of your word would, would break into our hearts and our minds, Lord, that those who do not know you, who hear my voice, would, would come to know you today in a true way and that they would have salvation. We pray for those who, who know you, Lord, that you would use us to renew our minds and help us look more like Jesus. God, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. So speak now. Your servants are listening. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, John chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 15 today. And Lord willing, make it through verse 25 and finish the gospel of John. And we've been walking through the Gospel of John for, for quite a while now, right around a year, year and a half, I believe it is. And so we have been uh, on this constant journey to see Jesus for who he is and be in awe of him, in awe of the Son, the S-O-N, the Son. And so my, my hope is that, that we're also going to see what's going on in this passage here today at the end of the Gospel of John, but also we're going to be able to tie up the whole Gospel of John together as we kind of survey the whole thing and remind ourselves and have God remind us of where we've been and what the purpose of this book, this Gospel, is. So as you're turning to, to John chapter 21, uh, let me remind you quickly, last week Jesus appears, reveals himself to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. He goes, they arrive there, they, he told them to go there, so they go there, and uh, Peter has this idea, you know what, I'm going fishing. And the other guys are with him, they say, all right, let's go fishing, and they go out, and they're fishing all night, and they catch nothing. And it was a reminder to us that if we, if we don't wait on Jesus, if we do things on our own, do things our way, uh, it's not going to be fruitful. However, Jesus appears on the scene, darkness is fading away, light comes, Jesus is there, and he tells them to cast the net on the other side. They didn't know it was Jesus yet, they do it, boom, 153 big fish. And they're not able to pull up the net, 
John immediately goes, ah, it's the Lord. Peter ties his garment around him in the water, running to Jesus. And we talked about this is the first time that Peter really has come back into the story with any detail. And so we, we talked about was the encouragement is, even though Peter had denied Jesus, which we're going to talk about a little bit today, he still runs to Jesus. And the encouragement was sometimes when we, when we sin, uh, when we're, we're not following like we should, we have this tendency to withdraw from Jesus, to withdraw from the church, from his word, from prayer. And Peter, no, no, run to Jesus. And that was an encouragement for us. We see that as they, they, they come, Jesus has breakfast prepared for them. And we see the kindness of our Lord. And he says, come. And he has this fellowship with them around this charcoal fire. And he gives them the fish and the bread. It's a reminder of when he fed the 5,000 and more. This reminder of his abundant care. The fact that he will take care of us, of the disciples, because he loves us. John ended that section saying this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So I'm going to start in verse 15, read through the text, then we'll work through it verse by verse. John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. We see that Jesus calls in Peter. Peter goes running to him. We see the disciples come in. We see that Jesus has breakfast for them, the fish and the bread. They eat breakfast together. And now the story focuses in on Peter a little more. And this is encouragement because really we're all Peter in many ways. So verse 15 says this, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I'll stop there for a second. They, they finish breakfast and we're about to find out it seems like they're walking down the beach together. They're starting to walk in and Jesus is having this intimate moment with Peter. He's talking with Peter. And again, this is to show, again, this personal relationship and this care that he has for Peter, that he has for you, that he has for me. It is a personal relationship. And he's going to speak and say to Peter exactly what Peter needs to hear, just like he does with us. But look how Jesus starts. He said, Simon, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What's interesting is he hasn't referred to Peter and the rest of the Gospel of John except when he first called Peter. When he first calls Peter to follow him, that's when he refers to him as Simon, son of John. 
And it seems like by saying that, Jesus is going all the way back to the beginning. Going back to when he first called him. And maybe that's to show in this second calling. This kind of reestablishing of Peter. So Simon, son of John, taking it back to the beginning. Brothers and sisters, think back to the beginning of your walk. Jesus would say to you, do you love me more than these? There's a lot of debate. Different commentators talk about what is he talking about in this situation? What is Jesus talking about? Do you love me more than these? What, what are you talking about, Jesus? These what? Could be the fish. The fish that's left over. Again, Peter, we know, is a fisherman and he's gone out earlier, leading the other guys, going to get fish, maybe returning back to that old way of life. Could he be referring to the, the lifestyle that he had before? Do you love me more than the fish? Do you love me more than that lifestyle before? Could be saying that for sure. He could be saying, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these disciples love me? Could be saying that. There's been times that Peter's kind of been kind of bolsterous, he's kind of been forward, and oh, I love you, I'll do anything for you, Lord. A little bit prideful in the past, especially before his fall. Could be saying that. Or he could be saying, Simon, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than you love them? Am I first in your life, Peter? He could be saying that. There's a lot of discussion and debate. So the question is, well, what does it, what does it mean? What, what does it mean for us? Well, here's how I think it's helpful. Whichever route you take, whether it's does Simon love, love, love Jesus more than the fish or that, that lifestyle, his old life, or other people, or more than other people love Jesus. Whatever it is, I think what's important is the question for you today, for me today, is do you love Jesus more than anything? Do you love Jesus more than these? And what's great about this is for some of you, these might mean your family, your friends, your job, your reputation, the things of this world, money, power, whatever it is, the question is, do you love Jesus more than these? Look at Peter's response. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So he responds back, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And here's what Jesus then says. He said to him, feed my lambs. Where, where is that coming from? Why doesn't Jesus say, okay, great? Well, what he's starting to do here is he's starting to show Peter what his role, what his path is going to be in his life. So he talks about the lambs first and feeding the lambs. We're going to see more of this as we go throughout. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, same way. Now he says, do you love me? He, he leaves out more than these this time. Do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Still talking about Peter's path. And he's talking about the lambs and the sheep. This seems to be, we know that Peter is going to eventually become, he is an apostle, he's going to become a pastor in the church. He's going to be responsible for leading people. That's going to be Peter's path. Seems like the, the lambs and the sheep, this is gonna this is gonna include all of the people in church in the church, all of Jesus' people, all of his flock, the little ones and the big ones. Peter's not to forget any of them, and he's to feed them and he's to tend to them. Again, this seems to be showing different parts of what Peter's going to do. He's gonna feed them with the word of God, preaching and teaching and writing. We're gonna see first and second Peter that Peter writes, feeding us, feeding. Jesus' lambs and his sheep, but also tending to his sheep, pastorally, taking care of them is what this seems to be. This is Peter's path. Verse 17, he said to him a third time. Now we have a third time that Jesus is, is asking a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. 
And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The sheep are brought up again and then the feeding again, the word of God. But what's interesting is we see this is three times that Jesus asked the question. Some of us, we, we, we hate being asked questions multiple times. Are you not listening to me, Jesus? So you know that I love you. I mean, I've already answered you. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus, he doesn't waste anything. And he's teaching Peter and he's teaching us. If you go back to John chapter 13, John chapter 13, go to verse 36. This is in the upper room after Jesus washes the disciples' feet and he says that one is going to betray him. And he gives this new commandment that they're to love one another as Christ has loved us. And then in verse 36, John 13, 36, listen to this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Hold on to that. Where was Jesus going? Well, this is the, the night before he's betrayed. So he's going to the cross. He's going to die. Peter, you can't go. Here's what Peter says, verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay, my, my, lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. As we saw in the Gospel of John further in the story, we saw that Peter ends up denying Jesus three times. And now in the, one of the last conversations that Jesus has, in the Gospel of John in particular, he asks Peter a question three times. Denied him three times, he's asking the question three times, do you love me? Back in verse 17 of John 21, Peter was grieved. I'm in the middle of the verse. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Peter was grieved, I think, because it reminded him of his denial three times where he had failed. But Jesus doesn't leave Peter there. And look what Peter cries out to. In the, last, in the past, it seems like Peter would cry out and just and, and, would, and would say things to Jesus or say things about himself where it was on his own strength. I'm going to do this, Lord. It's because of how much I love you, Lord. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to follow you. I'll do anything for you. And look what Peter has learned now. Verse 17 still, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, here's what he says, you know everything. See, Peter changes and he just talks about Jesus and what Jesus knows and that Jesus knows the heart. And he just says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said to him again, feed my sheep. But look what he then goes on to say. We, we see that this is actually going to be true. Why? Because look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, Peter, you used to dress yourself and you walk wherever you walked wherever you wanted. Okay? Your life being young, you can go anywhere you wanted, Peter. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. What is he talking about? Verse 19 helps us. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. So what Jesus is now saying is, you know what, Peter? I do know everything. And, am I, and I am gently restoring you back. And I've asked you three times, and you do love me. And I'm going to give you my spirit, and you are going to be bold. And you are going to be able to follow. And here's what it's going to look like, Peter, is you're actually going to follow till you're an old man. But at that time, someone else is going to dress you. They're going to put you in the clothing. They're going to stretch out your arms, and they're going to put you on a cross. And you're going to die and glorify God. And according to tradition, we see that Peter was indeed crucified. And some traditions say that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified upright because that's how his Lord was and he wasn't worthy of that. And so what we see is Jesus restores Peter and by his grace, Peter stays faithful to the end. 
But he's not at the end yet, so look what Jesus says. And after saying this, this is at the end of verse 19, after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, you messed up. You were too proud. You were trying to do too much on your own strength. And you failed. But let me show you. Let me lovingly bring you back in. Let me remind you of your first love. When I first called you, Simon, let me remind you that I'm your first love. This is the same thing that Jesus says in the book of Revelation in one of the seven churches, that they had fallen away from their first love. Brother or sister in Christ, have you fallen away from your first love? Can you hear Jesus saying to you, calling you from when he first called you, reminding you of that? And saying to you, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than the world? Do you love me more than that way of life? Do you love me more than you love other people? Am I the most important thing to you? If so, this is your path, whatever that is for you. Peter, here's your path. Feed and tend to my flock, to my lambs and my sheep. Brother or sister, I don't know what your path is. But what Jesus would say to you is, follow me. Follow me until you die and finish well. So he says, follow me. Now, verse 20 is a little bit of a shift here. They're walking down the beach, it seems. And, and Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Now, again, we know that this is how John refers to himself. So it seems like, Jesus and Peter are walking together, and Peter kind of looks back and he sees John. Now, why is he asking about this? Well, well, one, it could be that he cares for John. And two, it could also be that maybe he's just a little bit focused, concerned about others. Well, I'm, I'm going to live a long life, and then I'm going to die this way? Well, what about Peter? Or what about John, I mean? Whatever the reason, look at Jesus' response to him. Verse 21 Verse, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So we don't know fully why Peter asked this question again. Care for John probably is mixed in there. Worried about what's going on with somebody else. That's mixed in there. Especially the way kind of Jesus rebukes him here. Jesus says, what difference does it make? If I decide that when I come back at my second coming, if John lives that long, what difference is it to you, Peter? You follow me. Now, Peter's done a good job running to Jesus out of the boat. He's running to Jesus, but now Jesus is restoring him, reminding him when he first called him, reminding him of when he failed miserably on his own strength, and showing him his love and kindness and restoring him and saying, I have this path for you. You follow me. And Peter goes, but what about him? No, you follow me, brother and sister in Christ. This is a good word for us. All too often we are focused on what other people are doing with their walk, with their way. And there's a, there's a sense in the Christian faith, certainly we are to walk and bear one another's burdens and encourage one another and lift each other up and share, and share songs, psalms, spiritual hymns with one another and, and do all these things. We're, we're to do that. But first and foremost, our focus has to be on Christ and following him. And this is a good word for you today. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing at the expense of your following. You need to follow Christ well. Focus there, the path that he's given you. Don't compare your path to everybody else's. Peter, don't worry about what John's doing. Brother, don't worry about that sister's doing or that brother's doing. Don't worry about that. That's what God has for them. What does he have for you? Follow him. He will show you your path. Don't get caught up in worrying about what other people are doing. That's not your role. Your path, your role is to follow Jesus. Verse 23, So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? 
John gives us this little more information that apparently it started to spread that John wasn't going to die until Jesus comes back. And John's helping us because now again, remember by the time John wrote this, this was much later. John's saying this, this idea spread and it's not what Jesus said. Sometimes, and this is important for us too, because sometimes we, we read into things more than we should. We don't listen carefully, we don't listen well, and we take what we want out of something in Scripture or something that we're, we're hearing from God. And what they're taking from this is, oh, look, 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 John, John's not going to die. That's not what he said. Listen carefully. Read carefully. So John fills us in that that's not the case. That's not what Jesus was saying. Then he goes into verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. So the same one that Peter's talking about, the one that the stories were about, John, now he's saying in verse 24, this is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things. I'm the same one who's writing this and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. I'm an eyewitness, I've seen these things, and what I have said throughout this section and the whole gospel of John is true. That's what John is saying. Verse 25. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So, in some sense, this could be hyperbole. This could be John kind of saying, just kind of overstating about, oh, well, Jesus, if we were to write everything down, the world could even contain it. And, and he could be overstating. But you know what's incredible is, if you think about who Jesus is and all that he does and the fact that he is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God who holds all things together and is working all things I think this is true. The, the books can't even contain it. And we're going to be in heaven forever seeing what our God and what our Lord Jesus has been doing. So what's the, the takeaways here in this passage? And then let's connect it to the whole Gospel of John. Remember the Gospel of John, in, in chapter 20, John had said this. This was the purpose of his book. Let me remind you, starting in verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Again, like he just said at the end of 21, he did so many things that it could just fill up the whole world. Verse 31, John 20, 31. But these are written. Here's the reason the Gospel of John is written. Listen. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That was the, the point of John's writing. And so if you'll remember, as we've gone through the Gospel of John, let me just remind you, it started off. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then talks about John, the Baptist or baptizer who comes, gives testimony about this one, the, the Word, the eternal Son who became man, who became flesh. And we saw more of John the Baptist's testimony in chapter 1, and he talked about the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He calls his disciples. Chapter 2, we saw the wedding in Cana. We saw that he cleansed the temple. Again, chapter 3, Nicodemus comes and he talks about we have to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Of course, John 3.16, about God's great love, sending his son. John chapter 4, we talked about the, the, woman, the, the woman in Samaria who Jesus goes and he talks about there's a time coming where we'll worship in spirit and truth, filled with the Holy Spirit and in line with the word of God. We saw healings that Jesus did throughout the chapters, where he feeds the 5,000, where he walks on water, where he claims to be God. We saw these seven I am statements where he's going back, back to the book of Exodus saying, I am, I am, I am, showing that he is the eternal God. We see that he's the one who has the words of eternal life. We saw that they wanted to arrest Jesus. They wanted to kill Jesus. We saw his compassion towards the adulterous woman. We saw that he said that he's the light of the world, that he's the bread of life. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He said that it is the truth that sets you free. We saw that he healed the man who was born blind so that God may be glorified. The man couldn't do anything and Jesus goes to him and heals him. And then he was once blind and now he sees. And we talked about how that's our story. 
in chapter 10, we talked about, we saw how Jesus is the good shepherd and he will not lose any of his sheep. He will not lose any that the Father has given him. And he came for that purpose to come to seek and save those who were lost, us. He talks about his oneness with the Father, which ties back to the fact that he came from, he was in the beginning with God, and he is God, and he came. This is our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We saw that Lazarus died, and we saw again Jesus' emotion towards sin and death and how it's not how it's supposed to be, but he comes to destroy all that. He said that he is the resurrection and the life. He raises Lazarus from the dead. We saw that Mary anointed Jesus at Bethany before he goes in to die. And we saw that how she's willing to give up this, this precious thing to her, this heirloom that was passed on. She gives it up for Jesus because he's better than everything. We saw the entry and where the people were shouting Hosanna, but then by the end of the week, they're yelling crucify him. We saw that he came in in a humble way on this donkey because he's supposed to come the first time to, to seek and save us and to serve us and to die on the cross. We saw that then the, the Greeks start to come and then Jesus is lifted up. But before he's lifted up, we see this long few chapters of Jesus' long time where he's with his disciples in the upper room and he washes their feet. We see Judas betray and run away. We see this new command. We saw again Peter's, uh, d- uh, the foretelling of Peter's denial. We see how Jesus promises that he's going to give the helper, the Holy Spirit. It's better that he goes away because then he'll send God's Spirit to come and live inside of us and the disciples. Jesus explained that he was the true vine and we need to be into the vine because we're the branches. And if we'll remain in him and his spirit remains in us and his word remains in us, we can bear fruit. We saw as it continues, it continues to teach in the upper room. And then they go to the garden. Then we see Judas comes, betrays Jesus, and they take him. And we saw this this long scene with Jesus and, and how he had this false trial. And he goes before Pilate and discussions on Jesus is a kingdom, but his kingdom's not of this world. And what is truth? We saw that Pilate, he saw there was something unique about Jesus and he couldn't find any guilt in Jesus but he still delivered him because he feared man and didn't embrace truth. We saw that the, the true king of the Jews was mocked and crucified for us. And even though that was a, a sad occasion, in one sense the worst day, it was also one of the greatest because the glory of God is seen in the cross and resurrection. We saw Jesus was buried and we saw the resurrection and his appearance to Mary and the disciples and Thomas and now these disciples and now Peter and now John and all of that together and more. As John says, he wrote those things down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for our benefit to see that Jesus really is the Son of God, the the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one from the Old Testament. He really is the Messiah and that we would really believe that he's the Son of God and we would stand in awe of him And we would believe in him. And by believing, we would have life, true, abundant life. That is John's purpose. And so as he hones into Peter's story and John's story, how I think this ties together is Peter and John, they, they believe. Now, they don't have the fullness of the Spirit yet. That's going to come in the book of Acts. But they believe to the degree of what they know. And brothers and sisters, the question is, do you believe that he is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? All these signs that John was showing throughout the whole book for a year and a half, have you seen the signs that he is God? He is God's Son. He is the Word became flesh. He is the promised one from the Old Testament who has come to give you life, eternal life, to know God And be connected to him and enjoy him. And if you believe that, if you have believed that, then like Peter, no matter what you have done, continue to run to Jesus. And if you need to, take some time to think back to when he first spoke to you and called you to himself. And maybe you have a lot of mess-ups in between there. Keep running to 
Jesus. Because again, for John, throughout the Gospel of John, loving God means obeying God. Loving Jesus means following Jesus. And there's many of us who we might say, oh, we love Jesus, we love God, but we're not following or obeying. That's what he's teaching Peter. That's what he's teaching you. That's what he's teaching me. Do you really love him? Then by his spirit, follow him. Run to him and continue to follow him. You follow him in your path, not somebody else's. You follow him in your path. You follow the Son of God until the end of your days. And he will take care of you. And when you die, he will bring you to the place that he's prepared for you. And don't worry about everybody else. You focus on him and you follow him well. Verse 25 again in John 21 Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's because Jesus is great. He is worthy of our praise, he's worthy of our worship, and he's worthy to be followed. Because all the great things that he's doing, the world itself cannot contain it. Your mind cannot contain it. But trust him and follow him because he really is the Son of God and he really is the promised Christ. Trust him, follow him, have life, have abundant life. Follow him till the end and spend eternity learning all that he's done. May God bless you. Let's pray. Eternal God, we do thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for your grace in our lives. We thank you for the Gospel of John. We thank you that you have given us this portion of Scripture, of your word, that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the promised Messiah. We thank you that you've written this so that we might believe in him and have abundant life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life, not our own works, but your gift. Help us, for those of us who have not accepted that, who are still trying to do it on our own, help us to believe in Christ and accept your gift of grace and follow. Lord, for those of us who have accepted your gift of grace, who have cried out for Jesus for salvation, trusting in his death and resurrection, Lord, help us to follow well. Help us to make sure that we love you by your spirit more than all of these other things or other people. Help us to love you the most and be in awe of who you are. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.